In this video, I'm going to show you step by step how I motorized my Dobsonian telescope using the Easy Go To system by Romer Optics. In the kit will be the new altitude and azimuth encoders. These are upgrades from the Easy Push To encoders, which I had installed on my old telescope. These worked really well for finding deep sky objects, but had just manual tracking. The Romer Optics website has a full list of all of the different parts that you'll need to order. These are all numbered and explained. There's also a list of the compatible telescopes. In the purchase guide, they show the list of parts that come with the kit and the parts that you must order yourself. The three main things that you'll need to order yourself will be the power supply kit and then also the stepper motor drivers. Usually you'll just need two of those, third if you need to have a focuser and also then the stepper motors themselves. They recommend two NEMA 17s for an 8 inch dab and a NEMA 17 plus NEMA 23 for 10 inch or larger. Because my scope is a 16 inch and weighs a hefty 60 kilograms, I needed more powerful motors. For the altitude, I use a NEMA 23 2 amp 1.2 newton meter motor and then for the azimuth, I use the 1.8 amp 2.4 newton meter motor. Idea was to keep the amps as low as possible because this will have a serious impact on your battery capacity. I'll talk more about this later on in the video. So in the box you'll have your altitude and your azimuth encoders. You'll get a bag with the central bolt and magnet which you will replace on your existing scope. You'll get the two speed relay and the power adapter parts. Also this UART USB adapter that allows you to control your telescope using Stellarium. You'll get two motor slides and brackets that attach onto the NEMA motors. These are standard size brackets, so you don't need to worry about ordering a particular size. You only need to worry about it if you change the size of the motor for either your altitude or the azimuth. You'll also get the focuser bracket. You will have to order the focuser motor yourself, but included in the kit comes the focuser parts and the tooth drive wheels. As I said before, you need to order your own motor drivers and a smaller one for the focuser. I'll put links to these below. For the azimuth gear to roll on, you'll get a length of gear belt. And finally, the altitude arm, which I'm showing here already installed onto the bearing. There's an option when ordering to send your bearing to Romer Optics who will cut it on their lathe so that it will fit perfectly. I'd highly recommend to do this because you know it's going to be an exact fit, which is critical for tracking. You'll then just have to drill the four holes to attach the arm onto the bearing itself. And that's pretty much it for parts, so let's get to building. Okay, so the first thing that I did was I installed the AZ motor and I really didn't have any idea where I wanted to put this initially you'll see as the build goes on i actually move it to the side um, there's a reason for this i'll explain later but it's quite simple to actually uh, mark out you literally just put it down onto the edge of your scope um, and then just drill three holes be very careful when you take the slider off uh, because the ball bearings will pop out um, the solution to this really is just don't take it off you can actually mark out where you want to drill by leaving it on and then attach the slider onto the bracket and then fix the um, motor itself onto the scope. It's important you get a good fit here and that the toothed drive wheel sits pretty much in the center of the bottom board. I had to loosen the grub screws and adjust it up and down until I got it right. The next thing I attached was the azimuth belt. This came with a sticky tape on one side and it was fine to begin with but after a couple of tests I found that it started to move so I added a stronger tape which lasted longer but still had a little bit of movement so I ended up actually taking the whole belt off and just glued it on with super glue. The next thing that I installed was the altitude arm so you can see here on this example I already had uh, it installed on a part that I had bought from Romer Optics, but what you would need to do is take off the altitude bearing and then install the arm. So to take off the altitude bearing, it's very simple. You just unscrew the nut at the end that holds on the black handle. And then you'll find that there's a little screw 
that tightens into the handle so you just take that screw out and then you should be able to unscrew the whole black part itself once you've taken off the handle you'll be able to see the ball bearing ring so this just simply slides out and behind that is the plastic tensioning ring and that just slips off then lastly pull the u-shaped bearing through the altitude arm it may need a little coaxing but with a little force it should slide out the next thing you're going to need to do is to remove the whole bearing side itself so this is held in by two screws so loosen the silver arm first on the outside with these uh, hex nuts and then on the inside use a phillips head screwdriver to loosen the actual black attachment then once you have the whole side bearing removed you can attach the altitude arm and then reposition it according to the markings when you removed it and then it's a simple case of reattaching the full bearing assembly with the now installed altitude arm you may be tempted because you have it disassembled to add lithium grease or some other sort of lubricant here don't do that because you need to have just enough play so that the arm will move smoothly but enough friction to hold it in place the next step is to install the altitude motor now to do this you're going to need to mark out the arc of the altitude arm i found the simplest way to do this was to just draw a line using the arc itself with a pencil and make sure to mark it in the 90 degree position because this is where you're going to need to drill the hole so then you drill two holes wide enough to allow for the width of the drive wheel and also the up and down movement of the motor then when i had the two holes drilled i used a hacksaw blade to smooth out the oval and I also cut out a notch to allow for the wires of the motor to come inside the scope. And as with the azimuth motor, the altitude motor is attached in the exact same way and you can see that an elastic band is all that's needed to engage the drive. Now I know a rubber band doesn't sound very high tech, but to be fair, sometimes the simplest solution is the best. So the first thing that I wired up was the motors. Now I don't have any great experience in wiring or electronics so I just simply followed the instructions that were included in the box. Sometimes the instructions were on a piece of paper or they might be actually printed on the motor themselves. There's a very good diagram on the Romer Optics website that shows you how to connect the drivers to the encoders. You just simply follow the diagram and if I can do it, anybody can do it. Probably the trickiest thing to do for me was to solder the parts together for the power board. But with a little bit of patience, I finally managed it. And I'm really glad that I did because this power board is very useful for providing the correct power and voltage for each of the parts of the system. You just need to provide a steady 20 volt DC into the unit and then the DC converter will actually step it down to 5 volts which powers the uh, easy go to module itself and also the relay for the dual speeds. Now I didn't add a focuser motor but in principle the setup is going to be the exact same. To power everything I had an old battery from a power pack that I removed so I could sit it on the side of the telescope. Because it's a 12 volt 20 amp hour battery I needed a step up converter that boosts the 12 volts up to 20 volts. To connect the battery, I used my newfound novice soldering skills to attach two L-shaped connectors. I got these in a crimping kit that I bought on Amazon and I'll put a link in the description. To power on the unit, I reused the on-off switch that was part of the old power pack that I had. I'll upgrade this later by installing a more permanent solution that has an LED switch. Then it was time to test the voltage booster. Now I did this by testing the voltage to the drivers first and then to the encoders just in case there was any issues. So now is the moment of truth. There's a satisfying 
clunk when you hear the motors engage. So at least I know that there's power going to the motors and they're now holding their own in terms of torque. And I can see that I've got flashing lights on the easy go to system, green lights on the drivers. Everything looks good. We're ready for go to testing. Spoke too soon. So this is what it sounds like when there's not enough power or voltage from the battery going to the drivers. So the solution that I came up with was to install a voltmeter. In hindsight, this is something that I should have considered even before turning on the unit. I had checked the level of the battery before I started the test, but obviously from on off testing over a course of an hour or two, it had drained it quite low. So after I had purchased uh, the uh, voltage unit from Amazon, again, links in the description, I installed it onto the front of the scope and was good to go. So I finally got to do some indoor go-to testing. Um, bear in mind, the video that you're seeing is uh, sped up two times. The reason for this is that I initially had only a single motor speed on the unit before installing the dual motor speeds. So using the easy go to app, uh, you go to the settings section at the end of the setup and you click on motors learning and you can see from the video again, the motors go through a series of steps to test the altitude and the azimuth uh, motors and tracking. And then once that's completed, you get a notification to say that the test is completed and you're good to go. When I knew that everything was working as intended, it was time to do some cable management and weatherproofing. I ordered a couple of project boxes from Amazon and used these to house the power unit. And then using masking tape, I just laid out where I thought the wires would neatly go. Bearing in mind that there's not a huge amount of room between the lower tube assembly and the rocker box wall. So it pays to spend a bit of time figuring this out. Climate gets a lot of dew and moisture I decided the best way to protect the electronics from it was to reuse some material that I had left over from a dew shield project. It's effectively just a gym mat and I have a video on that you can check out. I cut a smaller piece then to cover the azimuth encoder and just stuck it down with some heavy duty double sided tape. Again, not very high tech. You may have a better or different solution, but I find that this works very well for me. Because there's not a huge amount of space between the lower tube assembly and the side of the rocker box, I find that this was a very, very easy way to reduce the space and not worry about whether the tube was going to hit off the box. It does rub against the uh, material when it's in operation, but it's not a problem. So that's it, pretty much everything's set up, ready to go. Now we just have to wait for the clouds to clear. It took about a week for the clouds to clear, but finally we've got a good night. First thing to do is level the scope. As you can see here, I built a dolly to transport and to level the scope. I used some galvanized concrete post levelers to act as feet to level the scope. And this allows me to adjust each foot individually so I can get perfect level and knowing that it's going to be able to take the weight of this very heavy telescope. For the lifting arms, I used two lengths of metal that I had from an old roof rack system. And then I just added some pipe warmers to the ends for grip, centered and then screwed down the bottom circular base of the telescope. The whole idea of building the scope this way was to make it compactable so that I could actually break it down and set it up very quickly and also transport it quite easily. So from taking the scope out of the boot of the car to having it fully set up takes approximately 15 minutes. So it's the moment of truth. Finally, the clouds have cleared, everything's set up. Battery is ready to go. We're at 97%. That satisfying click to know that the motors have engaged. Red lights are flashing on the unit in the correct sequence. Everything's good to go. So to connect the easy go to app to the unit, first of all, make sure your Bluetooth is on and you connect to Roamer Optics. 
Next step is to do your first star alignment. This is called encoder's offset. So you will be asked if you want to restore, you say no, click offset, then go to encoder's offset and continue. And then you'll get a list of bright stars to set your first star alignment on. Because we were facing towards Arcturus, I decided that would be our first star alignment. And while it's in this mode, the motor's clutches are off so you can freely move the scope about. And then it's just a case of centering the star in the eyepiece. Then once you're happy that the star is centered, go back to the app and click on the star that you've chosen. In this case, it's Arcturus. And that clunk tells you that the clutch is now re-engaged so you can go on to the next phase which is doing a second star alignment and i do this by clicking on deep sky overlook and then bright star list and then from that list i choose which star i want to do my second alignment on in this case it's polaris after i click polaris i get a pop-up asking push to yes or no and i select yes and now the scope starts to slew to polaris I'm not exactly sure why it doesn't say go to here also. I'll ask Romer Optics and update in the comments later. So I've sped up the tracking here to two times the speed, but you can see the crosshairs are locating the object. And once it's located the object, it'll say it's centered. Then you just need to set the encoders to offset. And that's effectively now setting your second star alignment. The more zones you do, the more accurate your go to. So now I'm going to test out the combination of push and go to and effectively what this is is you push to roughly where the object is and then the scope will take over the final go to. So I'm choosing a Messier 13. Don't choose go to, choose push to and then the clutches disengage. Now manually move the scope towards the object following the indicators on the screen. And then once you get into around 10 or 15 degrees of the object, you'll see a flashing circle. And once you leave go, the scope will take over and finish the final go to. It may take 30 seconds to a minute for the easy go to system to align fully on the object. Underneath its name on the screen, you can see the adjustments it's making in azimuth and altitude. And on the third line, you can see the go to status. And once it says tracking, it's now ready to observe. So a quick peek through the eyepiece to see that it all work. Success, I'm a happy man. So with the first test out of the way, I decided to put the easy go to system through its paces. And I'm delighted to say that the tracking and go to accuracy is fantastic. I've had the scope four years and operated it manually, but having tracking really makes it feel like a new scope all over again. So if you're looking for a DIY solution to motorize your DAB, I highly recommend checking out Romer Optics Easy Go To. Thanks for watching. Please consider subscribing and clear skies.